All right, uh, we're live at Kansas City Java User Group, and tonight we've got. Oh, microphone. All right, mine might be easy. All right, tonight we've got uh, Simon Ritter, who's going to be talking to us about uh, Java language pattern matching. So, this is going to be a good one. Yeah, I did. I did hit the go live button. Is it live yet? There, it's live now. Okay. <laughs> Don't use these very much. <laughs> so welcome, everybody, to the Kansas City Java User Group. Everybody watching on the stream and watching us later, welcome to you as well. Uh, we want to thank our sponsors, uh, Clinical Reference Laboratory, who is providing us with our um, meetup.com uh, website registration fees. Um, we also want to thank Oracle. We didn't put them on the slide, um, but we want to thank them for uh, sponsoring our in-person venue. We're at Brouhaha in Overland Park, Kansas. So um, we are probably, we, we are starting to do in-person meetups again. So make sure you watch the meetup.com page for uh, details about that. Java news this month, we've had a couple of things that are getting, getting ready to land. Uh, Jakarta EE 10 is nearing its release. Uh, some of the features that are going to be included in that include multi-part media support. So that's going to be native to Jakarta EE. You don't have to go directly to Jetty to get that support anymore. Um, OpenID Connect integration, which is a pretty cool feature if you use any integration with an OpenID auth provider. Um, and it's going to be based on Java 11. Or, sorry, it's going to have a, a base JDK of Java 11. Um, and it's going to also add... Uh, JPMS modular modularization support uh, throughout the entire SDK. Um, Project Laden was just revived. Um, so the focus for this was in initially kind of to do ahead of ahead of time compilation, um, but the focus has shifted to improving the JIT compilation and JDK tooling to reduce the uh, startup speed for Java applications as well as reduce the memory and CPU usage. Um, I mentioned here it's an alternative to AOT that has fewer trade-offs, but will also provide weaker optimizations. And uh, there was a recent article on InfoQ from Brian Getz, who talks about um, data-oriented programming in Java. So this is a way to kind of shift the view or enhance the view from the object-oriented uh, nature of Java into a more data-oriented nature, and that includes a lot of the um, Project Amber features, uh, which Simon is actually talking about tonight. <clears throat> uh, in releases, uh, Eclipse Soteria 3.0.0, which is compatible with Jac Jakarta Security 3.0, uh, which is in the upcoming Jakarta EE 10 release, um, has that OpenID Connect piece with it. Uh, log for j 2.18.0. Put this on here as a joke because it actually doesn't have any security vulnerabilities fixed this time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it does require uh, a new compatibility library. If you're using SLF for J, uh, I think it's um, the most uh, recent 1.x release, 1.8 um, or higher. It has a different compatibility layer library now, so just be aware of that. Uh, Corcus 2.10 has been released, which has some experimental features uh, with Project Loom. So um, get to play around with something that's using some virtual threads under the covers. Um, JReleaser 1.1.0 was released. Um, this is a project that I kind of just found out flipping through uh, some release notes. And uh, it looks pretty cool. So if you release Java projects, JReleaser looks like a pretty cool um, a pretty cool thing to manage your releases and get everything related to the release out all at once. Um, Postgres SQL 14, I put this on there because the new syntax breaks their official JDBC driver. So if you're moving to Postgres SQL 14 and you are using new syntax, just be aware it's going to break. It also breaks the um, .NET driver. So if you're using .NET, um, I'm not sure why you're watching a Java user group, but, <laughs> but we appreciate it. Uh, but your driver is also broken. Uh, and Spring Boot 2.7.0 was released, which adds support for GraphQL, Podman, and Cache 2K. So some new functionality there. Uh, it's also intended to be the last 2x release. Um, 
before the 3.0 release, which I think is scheduled for November, uh, but I don't remember off the top of my head for sure. Um, in other news, uh, coming up with conferences, we've got local conference, KCDC, which is August 8th through 10th. Um, again, we are not hosting a meetup in August for Kansas City Java user group because we recommend people go to KCDC instead. Uh, JConf in Chicago, September 26th to 28th is a, is a good one. If you um, travel or are going to be in Chicago, want to go to Chicago, uh, it's a good one to go to. Uh, and then Java One, the return of Java One, uh, October 17th through 20th in Las Vegas. Uh, we're also, uh, sorry, KCDC is also looking for volunteers. So um, you can email uh, Gabby at kcdc.info if you want to help volunteer for KCDC. Uh, is there anything that we missed? Please let us know. Um, feel free to throw it in the comments on YouTube. Um, I don't see anybody shouting out stuff here in the room, so I'm going to assume I got most of the highlights there. Um, and also get involved. So the success of Kansas City Java User Group depends on the community of Java developers that we have here in the area and on YouTube. Um, so attend meetups, tell your friends, like and subscribe to YouTube channel. Um, you can suggest topics or speakers or locations. Um, we're happy to have that uh, always in our back pocket. Uh, we can't work in everything, obviously, but um, we love to know what you want to hear about. Uh, you can volunteer to speak at our paper call, and you can follow us on Twitter at Casey Jug. And also, we have a feedback link here. Um, we do have that posted out on our meetup.com page, and um, we appreciate any feedback that you want to give us. So now I will turn it over to Simon. Simon's the uh, deputy CTO. Yep for Azul Systems, um, which writes a couple of different uh, JREs. Yes. All right. Thank you. So uh, here's the announcement on your Microsoft Microsoft level to a micro profile of your current system. All right. Uh, in case anybody on the stream didn't hear that, uh, Microsoft joined the Jakarta EE uh, yeah. JDK and Microprofile Work Groups. Okay, right, I shall get started. Good evening, welcome. So what we're gonna talk about today is the art of Java type patterns. And this is one of those things that's new to the Java language in more recent versions. So first thing to talk about is a little bit about modern Java specifically. And um, what we've seen is a real shift in the way that the Java platform itself is being developed. It used to be that there was two, three, even four years between Java releases. And since 20, what was it, 2017, 2018, we now have two releases every year. So this is great. So we have a release in March, we have a release in September. And that gives us a number of benefits. It means that we're seeing more features being added to the platform more quickly than we've ever seen before. And I think that people like Brian Gertz, people like Mark Reinhold are doing a fantastic job of adding things in a controlled way and building on different features and making them linked together. A lot of the language work, which we're gonna be talking about in this presentation, is all covered under a sort of bigger project, which is Project Amber. And as it says here, the description for that is to explore and incubate smaller productivity-oriented productivity -oriented Java language features. The other thing about the faster release cycle is it also means that we could introduce the idea of preview features and incubator modules. What that allows us to do is to introduce something as a new either language feature or library, but not make it part of the standard straight away. That way, people can try it out, they can see whether they like it, whether they think there should be changes, and there's still the potential to do that before it does become part of the standard. So now, every language feature that gets introduced is a preview feature initially, goes through at least two iterations, and then it can become a final feature. And again, I think that's really good. We'll see a couple of examples of how that's worked as we go through. So, pattern matching in Java. We have had pattern matching in Java for quite some time, 
And in fact, you know, we have the java.util.regex package, which I had to go and check, and it was introduced in JDK 1.4. And if we look at that, we will find that you can create a pattern, which is the thing that we're looking for. In this case, it's A followed by zero or more characters followed by B. And then we can create a matcher for that with a string that we're interested in looking at. And then we can call matches on that and generate a Boolean to say, did it match the pattern we were looking for? And if we want to, we can do it in a single line. Now, interestingly, I did this presentation as a webinar uh, a couple of months ago. And at this point, two people dropped off because they must have thought I was going to talk about regular expressions and pattern matching using the API because they didn't get to the next bit, which I said, which is, this is not what we're here to talk about. <laughs> I was quite surprised when two people dropped off. It's like, why? But anyway, so we're not going to talk about this. It's not about APIs, not about libraries. What we're going to talk about is patterns in the language. Right, fundamentals of pattern matching. This is a language construct that's been around for a long time. You go all the way back to the 1960s and you will find that it has been used in a variety of, of programming languages. It's been used in Haskell. It's been used in Orc. Anybody used Orc? Okay, good couple of people. Excellent. I like Orc. It's a very powerful thing to use when you're doing shell programming. What do we mean by a pattern? So we can be quite explicit about this. A pattern has two parts to it. The first is a match predicate. And the match predicate is essentially determining whether the pattern that we're looking for matches a given target. So this kind of comes back to the pattern matching that we saw on the previous slide. We're looking to see, does it match? But we're doing it in terms of language features rather than through an API. So there is something, a test that we're going to do to see if we match something. And if it does, then we have one or more pattern variables that we're going to associate with this. And the pattern variables are conditionally extracted if the pattern matches the target. So that is the formal definition, if you like, of a pattern which has two parts to it. So there's a test and then a set of variables that we're going to use based on that test. Now, there are a number of different pattern types. The title of the presentation is about um, type patterns, but um, we've got several different types that we can use. First of those is constant patterns. And we've already seen this in Java. Technically, we've had this right from the very beginning, because if you look at a switch statement, you'll find that you've got case one, case two, case three. So that is matching against a pattern, which is a constant. And then obviously, if it is matching against one, it does whatever's in the case statement, if it matches two, and so on. In that case, there are no pattern variables because we have constants. Constants do not vary, so there is no point in having a variable. The one that we use most here are type patterns, which are related to the, so the type of the pattern is type, which is a little bit confusing, but, <laughs> but it's a type of pattern is type, but here we're talking about types as in Java types, meaning the classes that we declare and the things that we use in our programming. So we match on a specific type for our predicate. We have some other ones as well. We'll talk about some examples of these as we go through. First of those is a deconstruction pattern, which is where we are matching on something, but then rather than just using a variable which references part of the, or the, the thing that we're looking at, we then can extract information from that. So we're deconstructing the, the thing that we're dealing with. And again, we'll, we'll come to some examples on that. We then have the idea of a var pattern, which is where we match on anything. And this is related to the introduction of local variable type inference that we had in JDK 10, where we let the compiler infer the specific type for us. We simply say, it's going to be var. We don't care about explicitly stating the type. Let the compiler deal with it for us. And sort of related to that, we also have the any pattern. And the any pattern, which uses an underscore, is where we match against anything, but we actually don't care what that anything is. So you might think, OK, well, if we match against it and we don't care, what use is it? Aha, we'll see that later on. There is one other pattern type, uh, which is not listed here, which is a method pattern. But because we haven't got any examples of that, we don't use it. 
either at the moment or I can't see it being used at the moment in the future. I haven't covered that in this presentation. Right, so before we get into the pattern matching side of things, we need to talk about a couple of other features which have been added to the Java platform since JDK 11. First of those is switch expressions. So we have the switch statement in Java. Had it right from the very beginning. And to make life easy for people who were migrating from C or C++, they kept the syntax exactly the same. So it was very familiar for developers, and they knew exactly what they were doing. The drawback to that is it had all of the same problems that the switch statement did in C and C++. And the biggest of those problems is that for each set of cases that you have within the switch statement, you have to remember to put a break statement in. Because if you don't, the logic of the construct is it will fall through into the next set of case statements and execute whatever is there. That's the way it's designed. So as a show of hands, has anybody here ever forgotten to put a break in a set of cases? Everybody has. I know I've done it on a number of occasions. And that's one of those things where it can lead to bugs which are hard to find. Because you look at your code and you go, that cannot happen. It is impossible for that to happen until you realize, oh, I forgot to put the break in. There are some other things around the scoping of local variables, which is a little bit less than intuitive. So if we look at a switch statement that we would use in Java before the introduction of expressions, this is the kind of thing that we do. This is a very common idiom for the use of switch statement, which is that we're going to switch on one variable, and then we want to assign a value based on that to a different variable. Here, I've got switching on the day of the week, and then I want to assign a value to the number of letters based on the name of the day of the week. And the code is very familiar. We simply say switch on day, case Monday, case Friday, case Sunday, assign number of letters to be six, and then remember to put our break statement in. But of course, this is also error prone from the point of view that if I'm using an instance field for the number of letters, if I forget to assign a value within my case where I match against something, then the compiler is not going to complain. It will simply say, oh, OK, well, you've got an instance field. I will give it a default value of 0. And if you don't want to change that, that's fine by me. If you use a local variable and you forget to assign a value to it, then yes, the compiler will complain. But this is, again, problematic and can lead to bugs which are hard to find. In JDK 12, we then got the switch expression. Switch statement is all about executing a set of instructions, but doesn't generate a result. In an expression, we execute a set of statements, but it does generate something that we can then assign as a result to a variable. That makes our life easier, because instantly we've eliminated one of the problems that we had on the previous slide. We can say, assign number of letters to be the result of that switch expression, and do it once. So no worrying about, have we got return values within the, the switch expression itself. The compiler will check that for us, because it knows that each case has to return something. The syntax we use here, what you'll notice to start with, is that the amount of lines of code that we have is less. That's great. And this is actually one of the most, the, the best things about this particular feature. What the developers of this feature did was they looked around and they discovered this little known feature. It's called a comma separated list. And they said, right, rather than having case Monday, case Friday, case Sunday on separate lines, let's just use case Monday, comma, Friday, comma, Sunday. I can't believe it took them 25 years to figure that out. But there you go. So now we have all of those things on one line. They borrowed the arrow operator from the Lambda expression. The right-hand side of the operator is the value that's returned from the expression. And as I say, the compiler can check to see that you've either got a value being returned of the right type, or it's throwing an exception. So that's good, because the compiler can eliminate all those problems. And because we're not breaking, we don't have to remember to explicitly put a break statement in there. So much, much better than we had before. The other thing about this is that switch expressions must be complete, exhaustive. So we'll come back to what that means later, because it's quite important when we talk about pattern matching. The other thing we need to talk about in terms of new features 
related to our pattern matching is algebraic data types in Java. And there's two things to talk about here. The first is how we represent data classes. And it was interesting you said about the article that Brian Gertz had written uh, about this very feature. What we do here is very typically we create objects through classes that we want to simply store some information in. And an example of that is a point. So a point has two values, x and y. Great. To do that, I will create a new class called point. And I will declare that it has two instance fields, a double x and a double y. I'll make them private to the class. And I'll even be good and make them final. Then I need to have a constructor. So the constructor has two arguments that I pass to it, double x, double y. I have to explicitly assign those values to the instance fields. Then I need an accessor method to return the value of those fields because they're private, so I can't access them directly. That's 14 lines of code just to create a tuple. And I always thought that you know when you look at JDK 8, for example, there's 4,500 classes in the standard class libraries. Why isn't there a tuple? And I did ask Brian Gertz about this. And he said, ah, yes, we could give you a tuple. And then you'd ask for a triple. And then you'd ask for a quadruple. So where do we stop? And he's quite right. So they came up with a better way of doing this. And the better way is records. So records were introduced in JDK 14. Essentially, what we do now is we simply say, create me a record, which is a form of class in the same way that enumeration is a form of class. It's just a slightly special form of class. And we'll declare it by giving a name point. And we'll use the same syntax we have for the constructor in terms of declaring what values we want to be able to store inside that record. So double x, double y. And because it is just a special form of class, it has a body in the same way that other classes do. So we'll have an empty set of braces. There's no information being added to it there. That's great because it means we go from 14 lines of code to one line of code. And we don't lose any of the readability. We can understand that a record called point has a double x and a double y. All it's doing is storing two values. Great. So that's a really big advantage. Now, Again, we can look at a few more things with records, which is that, firstly, we could make them generic. We could provide a generic type parameter for our record, t, and then we can store objects of type t in that record. That gives us more flexibility. The other thing we can do is we can add things to the body of the record. What we can't do is add instance fields which are not declared in the record definition. With my circle, I've got a value of the radius, which I'm storing, but I couldn't have an instance field that I declare inside that. I can have instance fields if they're static. So pi, static field, great, that'll work. And I can declare extra methods to add behavior to my record, calculate the area of the circle, and so on. So it gives us a lot of flexibility in, in terms of how we can use records. Just a few more details on records. Um, one of the things is that all records extend the java.lang.record class, which means that because we only have single inheritance in Java, you cannot have a record which extends any other class. It always inherits from the record superclass. However, because we can implement interfaces, we can certainly implement as many interfaces as we like and provide implementations of the necessary methods. The other thing, from an inheritance point of view, is that all records are inherently final or implicitly final. So you could mark them as final if you want to, but you don't have to because the compiler knows that they're going to be final anyway. And it's worth mentioning as well that all the fields that you store in a record are shallowly final. So they, they, uh, you can have no changes made to the values that you store in your record. Obviously, if you've got a reference to another object, then you could change the values within that object, but not the reference to the object itself. Records do not follow the Java Bean pattern. And this is something that was up for quite a lot of discussion when they developed records. The Java Bean pattern essentially says that if you've got a data class, what you do is you provide uh, methods to access the data using get followed by the name of the variable. And the logic behind that is that for the Java Bean pattern, you also have the ability to change or can have the ability to change those values. So you would have a set 
method with the name of the variable. So you've got a getter and a setter associated with that. Because records are shallowly final, then there is no uh, set method associated with these things. So they decided only to use the, the name of the variable rather than get followed by the name of the variable. That did cause a few problems initially because um, some of the frameworks like uh, Spring, for example, depended on the idea of the Java Bean pattern to declare data types within that. Now, they've, they've changed the way Spring works, so they do support records, and that's all kind of been resolved. But as somebody pointed out to me, there is a simple solution to this problem, which is to call your variables get x and get y. <laughs> Because, of course, if you do that, you get a get x and a get y method. So it's, it's a bit messy. I don't like it, but you know, if you really have to, you can do that. Now, the other thing to talk about is how we use inheritance in Java. Inheritance is part of object-oriented programming. Java is an OO language, so we have the idea of class hierarchies. In this case, we've got a simple example where I've got a shape as a superclass and I've got three subclasses, triangle, square, and pentagon. The problem that we face is that we don't have the ability to control who can inherit from shape. The only thing we can do is either allow everybody to inherit from it or nobody. So we can mark it as final, and then nobody can inherit from that. But it's an all or nothing thing. We would like to have more capabilities there. And what we saw in JDK 15 was the introduction of sealed classes. What this allows us to do now is to specify a set of classes which are allowed to inherit from a given class, and only those ones will be allowed to do so. We do that using a new modifier on the definition of the class. So we have public sealed class shape, and then we add a permits clause to that which lists out the classes which are going to be subclasses, triangle, square, and pentagon. If somebody were to come along and say, oh, I like that shape class. I'm going to use it and inherit it into a circle, the compiler will go, nope, circle is not listed in the permits clause, so you cannot compile that class. It's not valid. So we avoid that problem. Oh, I see what you mean. So do you really need the modifier to say it's sealed? Um, I guess not, but it's I, it's I would suspect it's more about it being explicit to make it really obvious that it is a sealed type. Because I guess technically you could have a sealed type that didn't have a permits clause, which would be final. <laughs> I haven't tried that, but it's, it's an interesting. Yeah. But yes, I think it's to be more explicit about that. Um, and, and also, you see, because um, one of the things about sealed classes is that all of the subtypes must explicitly state their inheritance capabilities. And there are three ways of doing that. So the first is that we can continue to make the class sealed. So we say public sealed class triangle and add another permits clause to say that we can have equilateral and isosceles as subclasses of triangle. So that's the first thing that we can do. Obviously, extend shape as well. Second thing we could do in terms of explicitly stating inheritance is to make it final. So nobody could then further subclass, in this case, the square. It would be uh, final. And then the third thing we can do is we can effectively unseal the class. So now anybody can inherit from Pentagon. The interesting thing here is that we have this new keyword, non-sealed. And there was, a, again, a lot of discussion about whether Java should have hyphenated keywords or not. And, and the decision was made that if we want to extend the language further, having hyphenated keywords was going to be very important because you know it just makes life easier. And because you can't have a hyphen in a variable name, it doesn't run into the problems of, of um, affecting backwards compatibility. However, it is worth pointing out that the, the new keywords that we've got here, so the sealed, the permits, and the non-sealed, are all contextual keywords, meaning that they only behave as keywords in specific places. And there's a very good reason for that, because what you could do is you could defer, declare two variables, one called non and one called sealed. And then you could say, sealed equals non hyphen sealed, which is actually the subtraction operation to say non minus 
the value of sealed. So yeah, so contextual keywords rather than real keywords. Right, so that explains the, so the background we needed. Now let's talk about what we have in terms of pattern matching in Java currently. By currently, I mean up to JDK 18, which is the, the current release. So the first thing that we added pattern matching to is around the instance of operator. Now, again, instance of has been in the Java language right from the very beginning, because being an object-oriented language, we have polymorphism. Polymorphism essentially says that when we have a reference to an object, we can view that object as any of the types that it actually is, meaning the specific type that we've declared it to be, any of the supertypes of that type, and any of the interfaces that it implements or the superclasses implement. So we can view it in many different ways, potentially. What this leads to is when we want to determine whether a reference is of a specific type, we have to use instance of. So test if obj instance of string. So we're testing against string. Now, if we do that, within the true branch of our if statement, we always have to perform an explicit cast with an assignment. So we have to create a new variable called string s, and we have to say that is obj and cast it to be a string, which really is not very nice because you know the compiler already knows it's a string because it passed the test. So why do we have to do an explicit cast? Why can't we just use it as a string? But that's the way that it worked. Now, in JDK 14, we introduced the idea of pattern matching for instance of. What we do now is say, if obj instance of string, and then if we go back to what I said at the beginning, where we have two parts to a pattern, first part is the match predicate. Well, that's the predicate because we're testing whether obj is an instance of string. So it evaluates true or false. If it's true, then we have a pattern variable called s which will be assigned the value of obj. In this case, essentially, it's a little bit of syntactic sugar, so that we don't have to do the assignment ourselves. We'll let the compiler fill in the, the line for us. In terms of the use of s, because we've tested in our predicate to see whether we've got a string, in the true branch, s is clearly a reference to a string, so we can use it there. But in the false branch, because we didn't have a string, S won't be valid, so the scope of it won't work and we can't use S. We can go a little bit further with that. We can be a little bit more clever. And we can say if obj instance of string S, and then we can add an AND operation to that and say S dot length is greater than zero, and test against that. That will work quite happily because we know that with the AND operator, we always evaluate the left-hand side, and only if that equates to true will we evaluate the right-hand side. So if the left-hand side evaluates true, then we do have a string. S becomes a reference to that string, and so we can use it on the right-hand side and test the length. If we were to try and use an OR operator, that won't work, because again, we know that we always evaluate the left-hand side of the OR operator, and only if it evaluates to false do we evaluate the right-hand side. If it evaluates to false, we don't have a string, so s wouldn't reference anything, and we couldn't then call s.length. The compiler will reject that for us, so we don't get a null pointer exception. Now, when it comes to thinking about the validity of the pattern variable, you do sometimes have to be a little bit careful, because it's easy enough if you've got an if statement, and you go if obj instance of string s, yes, great, we use it in the true branch. But we could invert that test. And we could say, if not O instance of string S, and then we return from the method. What that means is that the true branch is effectively the rest of the method. So S is valid until we exit the method, meaning we can use S immediately after we've done the test. We could have several hundred lines of code, and then we could use S again, and it will still work. Which brings us to the way scoping works for our binding variables. We use what is called flow scoping. If you look at local variables, local variables, we understand that the scope of those variables runs from where the variable is declared to the end of the block in which it is declared. Meaning, if you're in a method, if you're in a set of braces, 
if you're in a while loop or a do loop or a for loop, that's the places where the local variable is valid. The other thing about local variables is that they are subject to definite assignment. And that's the difference between instance fields and local variables. Instance fields will have a default value that the compiler will give it versus local variables. You have to make sure that at some point a local variable gets a value. Otherwise, the compiler complains. So for our binding variables, they're also subject to definite assignment, meaning they have to have a value assigned to them. But the way that the scoping works is the scope of that variable is wherever the definite assignment will be made. And that's where we can invert the test. And we know that because after the test, we return because we, we were false. So S will have a value for the rest of that block of code. It's definitely assigned in that block of code. So the important thing is that although the scoping of local variables and binding variables is similar, it is subtly different, which means that we can do something like this. So we can say, if O instance of integer and use a variable called num, then we can also say, else if O instance of float and use the variable num, or O instance of long and use the variable num. That's really good because, of course, we don't have to keep thinking up new variable names in that case. We can just reuse the same one, and it makes our life easier in terms of the code that we're writing. So that's one of the things we need to understand with flow scoping. Ah, right. So a puzzle for you. Pattern matching for instance of puzzle. Let's say I have this piece of code here. I create a new object, and I assign it to a variable called s. Not sure why I would call it S, because it's an object, so I should call it O. But anyway, I called it S. And then I say, if S instance of string S, print out the length of the string. Else, print out no string. So here is a, a question for you. Who thinks that this code will compile? OK, we have one person. Who thinks this code will not compile? OK, a couple of people. So I've got a couple of people who are sort of like, not sure whether it will compile or not <laughs> compile. Uh, anybody here think that it will both compile and not compile? <laughs> right, you are the man who got the answer right. Yes, so, so you, it will compile and it will not compile. So then you start thinking, hang on, how can quantum superposition work with code? That doesn't make sense. And the answer to this is if you type that into a file and you run Java C on it, it will not compile. The compiler will quite rightly say, you've already used s as a reference to your object. You cannot use s as the variable name of your binding variable. Very logical. So you think, great, that's the answer. Except if you put it into J shell, <laughs> then it will work. And you could, and I literally did a cut and paste to show that, you know, you, you start J shell, it's JDK 18, I used, um, uh, that's actually not the latest update. I think there's a new update yesterday or the day before. And if we create a new object and we do the same piece of code, it prints out no string because we don't have a string. I have no idea why that works. Because my understanding was that JShell sits on top of Java C. So all it does is use Java C underneath to compile the code and, and generate whatever bytecodes are necessary. But apparently not. And I did this presentation um, a couple of months ago at DevOps in France. And one of the people in the audience was a guy called Remy Forax who is one of the people on the Project Amber development group and does a lot of stuff on this. And he looked at this and he went, right, first I need to take a picture of this. And then it's a bug. <laughs> so <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, it's a bug. But it hasn't been fixed yet. Right, next thing that we have in terms of pattern matching relates to switch, hence why we were discussing switch earlier on. If we look at the way switch works, previous to this, we've been fairly restricted in terms of things that we can switch on. We can go with integral values, we can go with strings, and we can go with enumerations. What they've done now is expand that so that we can use type patterns as well. And what that leads to is something like this. So we create a method called type tester, pass in an object reference, and then we switch on O, and we have cases which are related to the type of that object. The first one we have is a case null. Now, technically, this is a constant pattern because a null is a null is a null. So there's no binding variable associated with that. And this is a new thing because in the past, we haven't had the ability to do a case null. 
that's a really good thing because again, it was one of those irritating things that when you used a switch on something, you would always have to, well, you should have done, you know, tested to make sure you weren't passing a null reference to it. Otherwise, you've got a null pointer exception. So we now have a case specifically for null. We also now can define cases for specific types with binding variables. Case string, have a binding variable s, and we can print out the, the string on the other side. Color, c, we can call the get RGB method on that. Now, primitives in Java are not types in the sense that we can use them in this situation. But arrays of primitives are types, which means we can have case int array and binding variable ia, and we can print out the length of the array. So we can use arrays of primitives. And then obviously we've got our default. So the way that null works has changed a little bit. And it's, it's, a, it's got a little bit more complicated in terms of how it works with the, the switch statement and expression. What's happened is that by introducing the idea to have a specific case for null, in order to maintain backwards compatibility with older code, what the compiler will do is actually insert a case null for you if you don't have one. So if you recompile old code which doesn't have a, a null case in it, then the compiler will insert that for you. And effectively, if we look at the code we had before, but we don't include a specific case for null, what the compiler will, will look at is putting in a case null that throws a new null pointer exception. So it's still doing the test, still generating a null pointer exception if you have a null, um, and everything worked quite happily. Oh, question? Yeah, how does that work at runtime um, if you have something compiled with an older... It would still work because the bytecodes will still generate a null pointer exception. It's only if you're compiling, new, uh, compiling code with the newer compiler that it will effectively do this. But old code will still work quite happily, yes. So the other thing they've allowed you to do, because we now have common separated lists, is that we can also include null with default. So if you want to handle both uh, anything that's not covered by your earlier cases and null in the same way, then you could do that. Now, I must admit, again, it's one of those little, little tiny details that you look at and you go, why didn't they do that? Because so they, they've, in the previous slide, we've got case null. But on this one, we've just got null because we're default. So they left out the case on that. So it's, I don't know, it's just one of those tiny little details that you just wonder about. OK, now, quite a big thing with the, the switch is completeness. I mentioned this when we were talking about switch expression earlier on. So in the case of pattern switch statements and all switch expressions, they must be exhaustive or complete, meaning they must deal with all possible values. If I have a method like this, so I pass in an object, I switch on O, I've got a case for string and a case for integer. What happens if I pass in a float? Well, logically, you could argue that because you know a switch is really just like a big if-then-else kind of construct, you could say, well, there isn't anything for float, so we'll just ignore it and carry on and leave the method without doing anything. But the designers of the switch expression and pattern matching said, Mm, yeah, it's going to lead to too many potential bugs. So what we're going to do is we're going to enforce the fact that you must deal with all possible types in terms of your switch statement or your switch expression. So here, what we must do is simply add a default. That will handle anything that's not a string or an integer. So it's, yeah, it's exactly the kind of um, system that we had before. No, nothing different to what we're used to. However, No. Okay. Exactly. You see, so if you if you have all the possible values from the enumeration, then default makes no sense because everything would have been caught before it would get to default. So the default is technically unreachable, yeah. meaning that you don't need to include it. I mean, I guess you could if you wanted to, but um, with an enumeration, it doesn't really make any sense. But that also leads on to the next slide very nicely because, of course, it doesn't mean you have to have a default. If you use a sealed a sealed class then you can have a case that will handle all possibilities. Change our type tester so it now takes a shape as an argument, and then we can switch on shape and say case triangle, case square, case pentagon, case shape, 
That way we have covered all possibilities in terms of the classes that can exist in that type hierarchy. Now, some people might think, well, hang on, didn't Triangle have two extra like subclasses which were you know, um, sealed classes of that? But of course, they're still triangles. So polymorphism works, and so even an isosceles or an equilateral triangle would be caught by the triangle case. So there isn't a problem of it not being complete. So that will still catch every single possible type that you have in terms of that hierarchy. Are these still evaluated in order, so does ordering matter? Yes, it does. Okay. <laughs> and that will be probably in the next slide or two. <laughs> the other thing we can do is similar to what we saw with the uh, pattern matching an instance of, we can include an and, so that we can do both a test on the type and we can then do uh, a predicate which allows us to test something based on that type. So with our triangle, we can say case triangle T and T dot area is greater than 25, then print out it's a big triangle. But we must have another case specifically for any other triangle because otherwise it wouldn't be exhaustive because if you had a triangle that was less than 20 or less than equal to 25 then without a triangle t on its own it wouldn't be caught by that and it wouldn't be exhaustive so the in jdk 18 the syntax for this is primary pattern and double ampersand conditional and expression in jdk 19 because this was a preview feature in jdk 18 they decided to make one small change they decided to use when rather than the double ampersand. <laughs> yes, that's exactly the, ex exactly the expression on my face when I looked at that and went, why? <laughs> because I guess they thought it was more, um, you know, more language, if you like. It's, it's more English language rather than computer language. I personally, you know, we use ampersand, you know, the and operator, all over the place. So why did we have to change it to when? I mean, there was, again, this is, you wouldn't believe all the discussions that go on on the mail aliases about these features, because there was a huge discussion about why shouldn't we use if rather than when. So you would have case triangle T if T dot area greater than 25. And then, uh, so Brian Gertz made the, the, the good um, thing. He said, no, 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 we don't want to overload if with more places where it can be used because you could end up with case triangle T if T dot area greater than 25 arrow if and then have an, a, like another if statement after that because that would be quite valid so it would get very messy so they have decided to use when that's that's all I will say about that so you have to use it for the syntax in that case yeah so, so if you had another condition it would be case triangle T when T area equal than 25 when no okay no because it's a conditional and expression so what you because you'd have to decompose okay. it so you have so you would then use ampersand yes with, okay. yes you would exactly which i guess is one argument for why you would use when <laughs> because otherwise it gets hard to parse because if you had when t dot area greater than 25 and t dot sides less than four or whatever um, then it, it would get more confusing but anyway that's the syntactic approach that they have taken it's always good to look at this stuff and, and you know see people's reaction to it pattern dominance so this comes to the question that you had about the order mattering yes it does because of course if we reordered the the simple example and we said put the shape as the first case then that will match everything as a shape because a, a triangle is a shape, a square is a shape, a poly, um, pentagon is a shape. So it would match everything on the first one and those three lines will become unreachable. And the compiler will reject that and say that it must um, be put last because um, otherwise you, you won't get to those lines and, and so you lose the effect of them. That also applies when we talk about guarded patterns. Because again, if we switch the guarded pattern over and we say case triangle T first, that will catch everything that's a triangle. So you would never get to the case where you were trying to match triangle T and evaluate the area being greater than 25. So that would be a problem. However, that doesn't mean that the guarded pattern always has to go first because there's a situation where, yeah, so that's just saying that, because 
what you could do is you, I don't know why you would do this, but you could do case triangle T when true, and that would obviously uh, mask the triangle T underneath. Now, that's, uh, that's a silly example, but there probably is a better example where you could say case triangle T when, and then have something that always evaluates to true. Um, even though you're not calling it true. It, it's something that always evaluates true, and you, you just don't realize it when you're coding it up. So you have to have the... Uh, the compiler will, will warn you about this. So it will always tell you that uh, there's an unguarded pattern or whatever. So essentially, what the specification says is a compile time error for a label in a switch block to be dominated by an earlier label in that switch block. So it's just saying you have to figure out the ordering, but the compiler will let you know if it doesn't like it. Right, pattern matching in future versions of Java. So we've seen one little thing that changes in JDK 19, but there are some other ideas as well. So right now, if we use records, we can use records with pattern matching and instance of. This is what we can do now. So we can say, OK, we've got our record, point, double x, double y. And we could say, let's create a method called Pythagoras. It's a little bit loose as a, a method, but anyway, we call it Pythagoras, takes a single object, and then we'll say, if O instance of point P, then we know we've got a record of point, and so we can extract the values of X and Y, and then we can calculate the hypotenuse as X squared plus Y squared square root. Great. But this is obviously a bit messy because we're having to extract the values ourselves and use those. So couldn't we do better? And yes, we can because the idea is to use pattern matching with records, which is a deconstruction pattern. So now what we can do is we can say, let's use records, and let's deconstruct those records. But because a record is simply a special form of a class, it will also work with other classes as well. So now what we can do is we can say, if O instance of, and then give the record definition, point double x double y, so that when we calculate the hypotenuse, we don't have to extract the values of x and y from that. We can simply reference them as x and y from the point. And that makes life simpler for us. So we're eliminating the, the problem there. However, we can take this further. Because let's make our example a little bit more sophisticated. We'll introduce an interface called rectangle. Then we'll have our record point still. And we'll have a numeration, which is color, red, green, blue. And we'll have two records which use those. So we've got a color point, which has a point and a color. And we'll have a color rectangle, which has two color points, the top left and the bottom right. And we'll also say that implements rectangle. Right. So what I could do is I could use a, the deconstruction record pattern and say, print color rectangle R, if R instance of color rectangle, and we've got color point top left, color point bottom right, then we print out top left dot C. So we're using the uh, deconstruction from there, from the color rectangle, to print out the value of C on the top left. But of course, that's a record as well. So we can compose our patterns. And we can do something like this. So we can have R instance of color rectangle, color point, point P, color C, color point BR, and then we just print out C. Now, obviously, in this example, you know, we're, we're um, I'm make it quite long and we're only using one line there, but you can see how if you were doing some more complex code, this would actually be quite beneficial. But of course, we know that point P is also a record. So we could extend that further. And we could have print top left X of rectangle R, if our instance of color rectangle, color point, point double X double Y, color C, color point BR, and print out X. But that's getting kind of messy now. So what we need to do is to simplify that and make it easier which is where we can introduce the var pattern. Simply use the idea that we have in terms of local variable type inference and let the compiler figure out the types for us. So we know that we've got types involved, but we don't actually really need to worry about that. So we'll simplify things by saying color rectangle, color point, point, and then we have var x, var y, var c, var br, because that's the things that we're only really interested in x. So we can do it that way. So this is something that is sort of planned at some point for Java. They, they've kind of talked about this. What they haven't talked about yet is the idea of using the any pattern. Now, this is not part of a JEP. This is 
it's pure speculation on my part. I don't even claim to have thought this up. I saw somebody else uh, suggest this as an idea. And so I think it's quite a good idea because this is where we could use an underscore because now what we can do is simply say, okay, we have something where we know we've got a variable involved, but we don't actually care what it is. And that's where it's like the idea that we have something, we don't care what it is. So now we tidy everything up and we say, right, we've got a color point, we've got a point, and we're interested in the X component of that. Everything else is irrelevant, so just mark it as an underscore so the compiler knows that we've got the right number of arguments. We just don't care what they are. So that tidies things up very nicely. And this sort of relates back to um, one of the changes that was made in JDK 9, where they went from the idea of um, no longer being able, or went to the idea of no longer being able to use a single underscore as a variable name. Anybody here ever used a single underscore as a variable name? Probably not. Uh, the good news is, if you have, then two or more underscores still does work as a variable name in Java. The reason they did that in JDK 9 was that they were going to use a similar approach to Lambda expressions. So that if you had a Lambda expression that had more than one parameter and you weren't using all of them, rather than having to think about the, what the parameters were, you simply mark the ones you're not interested in with an underscore and the compiler knows, okay, don't need to do anything with that, just ignore it. So that's, that's sort of related to that. So yeah, got no interest in those, we'll ignore them. The other thing we could do is, again, a deconstruction pattern, is to look at the idea of pattern matching for arrays. Because, again, we could take code that we could do at the moment. We could say, if O instance of, and remember, an array of objects is fine, so string array, and we'll also test to see if the length is greater than or equal to 2, then we can extract the first element, extract the second element, and then concatenate the two and print the result. Why not use? A deconstruction pattern for that. So we'll say if O instance of string array, and then we'll use the same syntax that we would use if we were defining an array of strings, and we'll simply say string S1, string S2, use the ellipsis to indicate that we've got a variable number of arguments because there could be many other elements in our array, and then print out S1 plus S2. So the compiler will do the deconstruction for us. So this was going to be part of JEP 405, which is the same JEP that does the record pattern. But for some reason, they've dropped that. I think they're still trying to figure out some of the details around making it work with the syntax and, and whether there are different changes that need to be made. Um, right, so, so just to sort of summarize what we've uh, looked at, um, pattern matching, I think, is a very powerful set of language constructs. And it does eliminate a lot of the sort of boilerplate code we've seen in certain situations and gives us interesting new ways of doing things. It also makes our code more declarative. Um, there's some other things underneath as well. Even though a lot of this looks like syntactic sugar, especially with like the pattern matching, for instance, of, there are some situations where we can use that and make the underlying code perform better by doing things that way. I think some of this idea of using underscores will be something that would be potentially better in terms of performance. Many of these features already available. Some are coming in JDK 19, JDK 20, and some will be even further from there. Just since I have an audience in front of me, I will briefly talk about what we at Azul do. Um, so as a, as a simple question, right? So who had heard of Azul before this presentation? Okay, so three out of four, that's good. So you haven't. So what we do as a company is basically Java. That's all we do. And we have two products. So it's a nice, small product set. That sometimes upsets our salespeople. What we do with the first product is simply a straight build of OpenJDK. It's equivalent to what the Oracle JDK... So <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so it's called Zulu. And then Azul Platform Prime is the idea of having a higher performing JVM. So we replace things like garbage collectors with a truly pauseless garbage collector. We also replaced part the uh, C2 JIT compiler with one based on LLVM. And we have a thing called Ready Now, which is about reducing warm up time by taking a profile of a, a warmed up application. So lots of stuff going on there. And the other thing we're doing more recently is um, cloud native compiler. If you're running in the cloud, why have all your JVMs do their own JIT? 
take the JIT out, put it as a centralized service, and then have the different JVMs called to the service to get the JIT done. Eliminates the use of or reduces the CPU load on the JVM as it's running the application and also allows us to cache code so that we don't have to recompile the code every time, especially if we're running multiple instances of a microservice, for example. So there's some interesting stuff going on there. Um, free offer. Um, we like to talk to companies and individuals. So the whole idea of doing this uh, Java user group tour was part of that. But we're very happy to do things for companies if you've got a large number of Java developers and you're interested in like the sort of presentation I've just done, or if you're interested in finding more about, more about what we do in terms of performance. It's not a sales pitch, really isn't. It's very low level technical stuff. We'll talk about JIT compilation. We'll talk about garbage collection, how these things work, how we can improve the, the way that things work, and so on like that. If you do things like brown bag, uh, you know, lunch and learn type things, then we can do that kind of thing. Um, it's most likely going to be over Zoom, because obviously I can't travel everywhere. But um, if you're interested in that, just feel free to reach out to me, and we can arrange something for that. And that's it. So that is the presentation. So I know we had a few questions as we went along, but if anybody's got any other questions, I'm very happy to take those. Or if there's any questions online. Yeah, nothing, nothing coming in on YouTube. So um, I would say we're probably OK to uh, wrap up. Sure, um, OK. Appreciate your presentation tonight, Simon. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, and we will not see you in August. <laughs> KCDC. KCDC.